and the plane. The way landed. This this identity message has been my message for the year, and I believe what I'm going to share to, with you today is going to just put the icing on the cake. It's going to be the put the cherry on top of this whole thing because this is such a vital message that every single man needs to hear. Every single man needs to hear. Now, I want to start this off, and you'll see the title. This is called King Me. Now, growing up, uh, my grandmother and I would play checkers. She's the one that introduced me to the game. Uh, I'm a competitive guy. I never remember her beating me. And it's probably more to do with her allowing me to win than my great skills at being checkers. But we would play for hours and hours and hours, and I loved it. And you know, looking back, uh, you'll notice if you play checkers, that there's an insignia on the top of every checker that's in the, the it's, it's a crown, it's a crown there. And that's because every checker that's created was meant to be a crown. It's got that potential. So I wrote in your notes a little bit of checkers rules guidelines so you could just kind of get up to speed here. And this will all make sense a little bit later here. But a checker gets crowned when it successfully makes it to the other side of the board. And once it does so, it has the right and authority to maneuver and function at a much higher level than it could prior to being crowned. I mean, obviously, the more crown checkers you have, the greater chance you have to win. So the reality is, however, that most individual checkers will not successfully make it to the other end of the board to be crowned because the opposition will jump them and knock them out of the game. Whether a checker achieves its greater goal of being crowned as a king is fully determined by the moves that are made underneath the hand of the one that's controlling it. So I want you to just put that in your in your mind this morning because we're gonna we're gonna talk about this silly game called checkers. And we're gonna tell you the story of a man named Marion Tinsley, who's considered to be the world's greatest checker player. But before we get there, but show it before I show you this video clip that's that's uh, blaring in my face right now. Uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this to set this thing up the right way. Uh, men, we are created to do what we can only do. We all have a unique DNA. We've been designed with responsibilities and duties that only we can fulfill. Gentlemen, you're not an accident. You are not a mistake. God does not have the word oops in his vocabulary. You were created and designed for something. And when God created men, and we're talking about manhood in general, he created them with a crown opportunity because every man is made to rule under the authority of God. And as you well know, men were created before women in the Garden of Eden. And in making man first, it's the same principle as when we pour the foundation of a home when we construct a house. And why does those things parallel? Well, here's the reality, because the success or failure of God's creative purpose of building his kingdom in history is directly related to the man's relationship and submission to God's rule in his life. So I wrote this, home foundations don't have to be fancy or pretty. But get this, they have to be strong. They gotta be strong. When a foundation is weak, everything else resting on it is at risk. And God holds men, specifically men here, responsible for helping keep the foundation of faith and family strong and steady. God entrusted men to care for specific duties here on earth while simultaneously advancing his kingdom purposes. And just to review, to set this thing up, you might remember last year, if you were part of what we do, I did a series called Momentum, and I shared with you four basic responsibilities that every man has been entrusted with, and these date back all the way to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Nothing has changed in terms of what God has want, wants men to do from that day, starting with Adam, all the way to today. We still have the same four basic responsibilities, and they're pretty simple, and they're pretty profound. Responsibility number one is that we are to be obedient to the truth of God's word. We're be a man of the word. We're to be to to this is our playbook. God's given it to us and says, I just want you to follow this book. This book is not to restrict you. This book is not to frustrate you. It's not to 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 limit you. It's to help you do life. And so he invites us to be a man of the word. Secondly, we're to to uh, love and protect women. 
That's, that's the job of a man, to love and protect women. That every woman that walks in our presence feels safe, feels protected, feels honored, feels respected. That's part of our duty as men. Our third duty is to be an excellent worker, utilizing the gifts and talents and abilities that God has given you. To be an excellent worker. And then the last duty is to simply build a legacy. And primarily do that for the next generation. Those duties given to Adam was the same duties that we've been entrusted with today. So, however, and you know, Satan enters the picture right there in early part of Genesis. He, his goal is to disrupt the plan, to literally jump men by taking them out. He does not want us to fulfill this divine, this divine ordained kingdom purpose that we've been, that we've been constructed to be. And so Satan will do everything he can everything he can to remove us from functioning in alignment with God's perfect plan. That plan involves our families, involves our churches, involves our communities. And guess what? Our nation has experienced the negative consequences right now of the, con and the confusion of men that are living independent from God. And guys, you don't have to look very far to see that manhood is in serious jeopardy. It is in serious jeopardy. Our, 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 too many men are living a life of defeat, discouragement, confusion, rebellion, addiction, a myriad of other things that affect the social and the, and the racial and the political chaos that we're experiencing today. I mean, it is clearly evident that things are troubling. Too many men have become neutered or domesticated or abusive or irresponsible. And our, and our society is showing the effects of being, of being torn, of being tattered being in utter dysfunction. Here's the reality. When the enemy takes men out, our culture is doomed. Man, we have, a, we have a responsibility. We have a duty as a man. We have a calling. We've been entrusted with some really special things. Are we going to utilize what God is doing in our life and simply follow those four things he's asked us to do? Or are we going to just watch this, this culture just crumble? And while there is doom and gloom everywhere, here's the reality. There is still hope. And here's the hope when men rise up. When men rise up as kingdom men that he's created us to be, that we have this intimate relationship with him while simultaneously we represent him in all that we do. God can reverse and he will reverse the downward spiral. He, there is hope when God is involved and he's waiting for men, men like you and I, to rise up and fulfill this calling, this responsibility that we have in front of us. Imagine just for a second, guys, what, 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 what it would look like if men simply said yes to this opportunity, to this invitation that God has to be a kingdom man. And here's the neat part of the story. God not only invites you to do it, but he says this, I will help you every step of the way. I will help you do this. See, with God's assistance and help working through the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to play Mr. Macho Man and try to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You don't have to do this on your own. God says, allow me through the Holy Spirit to work in your life so that you can fulfill the calling that you have. Craig White and I had a private conversation last week. I actually called him on Monday and I says, Craig, remind me of those things that you told me because I think they've tie in beautifully with what I'm going to talk about this week at TGIW. So we got on the phone and, and Craig said, these are the three life principles that he has been sharing with men for literally dozens of years. Three simple points and it ties so well with this message that I want to share today. Here's the first thing Craig says. If you're around Craig for any length of time, where is Craig sitting right now? Where's he at? Right there, Craig. Or Jersey man. Always got a new jersey on, doesn't he? Crazy cool. He's got a, quite a collection. Here's what he says, that God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Gentlemen, that's true for every single one of you. He loves you. And he's got a wonderful plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my life verses says, for, for, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you, plans to prosper, plans to give you a future and a hope. And that applies to every single one of you guys. Here's the second principle that Craig shares. God will never impose himself on you 
because he loves you unconditionally and he gives you a free will choice to accept him or reject him. Guys, if God did not give us a free will choice, it would not be love. Love is the basis for the reason he gives you a choice. He doesn't force you to love him back. He doesn't demand you love him back. He says, you decide what you want to do. That's real love when you give somebody a choice. And then the third thing Craig shares is this. If you seek God, he will point out his plans for you. And it's based on an Old Testament verse and a New Testament verse. Psalm 37, 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. One of the verses says he will accomplish it. One says he will act on it. All we have to do is simply commit to him, commit our ways to him. He says he will do it. And then Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. Uh, here's the reality. We ask, we seek, and we knock. God does not play hide and seek with us, guys. He does not want to frustrate us. He's not trying to confuse us. He simply says, ask seek and knock and i will reveal my plans to you so with that backdrop i want to share this video with you i found this through tony evans's ministry with and it's uh, it, it, and I, if you want to look it up yourself afterwards uh, i can send you the link it's a youtube link or you can simply go to tony evans king me and you can watch it again for yourself but marion tinsley is considered to be the greatest checker player of all time he's got a kingdom message that I think applies to every single guy in the room. So let's play it. Chris, here we go. What is possible? Win, lose, or draw. That's the outcome. But how you get there is almost infinite. 500 billion, billion different positions to play. And each piece with the potential to be your greatest ally. A king. My name is Marion Tinsley. I am a nine-time world checkers champion. I'm the son of a farmer and school teacher. I have a doctorate in mathematics and used to keep track of how many hours I studied checkers until graduate school. I was at 10,000 hours. I practiced to the point where I can predict 30 moves ahead. I went 40 years undefeated in matches. Every piece is made for the infinite possibilities and with the same potential. Will it become what it's made for? What it needs to be? That depends on the hand controlling it. I can't will it, but I can practice it. I can envision it. I can play the plays that bring out its purpose to be crowned. God created all men for a purpose. He's created me for a purpose. If I rise up to it, fulfill it, I know that I'll leave more than just a mark on this game. They say I am a legend. That might be who this game knows me as, how it defines me, but I see myself first as a kingdom-minded man. I don't know why I'm made for this, wired for this, but I know it's part of my purpose. When a challenge I face is an obstacle to my calling, I know the strength I summon to overcome it is what I'm also made for and brings me closer to my purpose. Obstacles, we don't run from them, we overcome them. And I needed one, something to challenge me. I needed to battle against someone or something. I knew I had more purpose to fulfill more of my calling left unanswered. They say the program, 
this AI could see options so far in the future that its programmer and many of my friends were saying no human can beat it. Marion is a champion. He hasn't lost a game since 1983. But we're constantly getting better, and Chinook is always learning. We feel confident about London. So I agreed to the unbeatable. Checkers is a test of what you can see rather than what you can remember. I began to think that Chinook might be the challenge that beats me. It was this moment I saw all the possible moves clear to the end. I knew I would win. You're going to regret that. I won. I beat the artificial intelligence they named Chinook, its coder, Jonathan, and most importantly, the challenge that stood between me and my purpose. We have inside us the ability for great things, for great purpose. For those who rise to the occasion, we might find ourselves to be kings. Obstacles, we don't run from them, we overcome them. We don't run from obstacles, we overcome them. We don't run from obstacles, we overcome them. As I love that video. I absolutely love that video. He talked about living your life with purpose. He talked about rising up to the calling God has in your life. He talked about fulfilling your destiny. And my question to you today is this. What is your kingdom? You've been created to be a king, every one of you. God, God has given you duties, responsibilities, a calling. I'm convinced that everybody in this room has something. You're the best 
there is. You are the best. And that's what Dan Erickson said. He'd say, you're the best. And that's, and that's what Dan was talking about. It might be a personality trait. It might be a, an attitude. It might be a skill. It might be a talent. It might be a gift. It might be something you touch. It might be something you feel. There's something here that you are good at. You might have a hundred of those things, right? Or you might just have one thing going. But the question is, are you going to be faithful in the king's work that God has given you? You know, the first Adam uh, brought defeat to the human race. I mean, defeat happened to the first Adam, but the last Adam, Jesus Christ, comes to bring victory. And it's time for it's time for men who are under the lordship of Jesus Christ to change the, the trajectory of our culture and submit ourselves to him and his example. So Dr. Evans, in his book, Kingdom in Rising, I wrote this. He challenges all men to accept and implement the responsibility handed to us by our Creator. This responsibility involves not only rising to the challenges we face, but also influencing a whole generation of men and boys to do the same. And if God's kingdom men decide to rise up and fulfill our calling, we can see him heal hearts, heal our families, our churches, and our nation. I wrote this, men, it's time to awaken men. Have them rise up to lead their families and infiltrate the culture as kingdom citizens. Men who will profoundly and victoriously wear their crowns and will be used by God to crown the next generation with kingdom values. Here's three things I want to give you and then three action steps. Here's three things, first of all. Our world needs men who are ready to wake up. We need to wake up, guys. Some of us have hit the spiritual snooze button. We've fallen asleep at the wheel. We've abdicated our responsibilities and high calling. We've, we've played the victim role. It's so easy to do. Our culture is, is just slamming men. And a lot of us have fallen asleep. A lot of us have fallen asleep. We have allowed the culture to overwhelm men and redefine manhood. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 13 specifically gives you a lengthy list of areas where men need to be attentive, where they need to be attentive, they need to be intentional, and they need to display leadership. And get this, it's not just for ourselves, it's for everybody else. In fact, that list includes things like this, um, being above reproach in our daily habits. It's talking about being free from the love of money, managing our household well, about remaining humble, not being conceited, about the value of having a solid reputation both inside and outside the church. And it goes on and on. First Timothy 3 gives you a roadmap of the things that men are to be attentive to. And then the second point is this. Our family needs men who are prepared to stand up. And part of the problem, guys, is that we care more about what others think about us than God says who we are. We might say, well, I don't care. I really don't care what people think about me. But then we turn around and boost our self-esteem through other things. We, by choosing success at work, to be successful at work in a bad way. Maybe it's a physical challenge that we tell people about. Maybe it's a, a product sold, a car purchase, a home remodel, an award won. And I'm not saying any of those things are wrong in and of themselves. But gentlemen, there are great things we can accomplish. But when we use those things to create self-worth, to build our self-esteem, we're running hard on the treadmill of self. On the treadmill of self. We're trying to boost our self-worth with things we should. And here's the here's the, the conclusion of this. By the way, no matter what you accomplish, it will never fully satisfy. And the world will say this, it was not good enough, whatever you did. So the key to standing up, I wrote in your notes, is this statement, is the recognition of who you are and whose you are. It's reminding yourself of who God says you are. When you stand on his truth, all insecurities, fears, and the need for human affirmation goes away. No longer you'd have to go to Facebook to get your plaudits. No longer you'd have to have a, a snappy uh, Twitter uh, tweet to, to feel worthy. No longer do you have to play or perform to draw attention to yourself and have other people tell you how great you are. Guess what? You are playing and performing for God's glory. You're, you're literally what Byron Shepard said a year ago. You're staying in your lane. You know your duty. You're, so you don't worry about what everybody else is doing. You just do what you do. 
Romans 6, 6 says it this way. It sums it up well. It says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so we would no longer be slaves to sin. And once we do that, then we can move to number three, which is simply this. Our nation needs men who are willing to rise up and be counted. And gentlemen, this is where it gets fun. Did you see the smile on Marion Tinsley's face when he knew that he had, he had won? 30, 40, 50, however many moves it was. He knew all the possibility. He knew what the end was going to be. And gentlemen, we should have that same kind of mindset. When we are on assignment, when we have a, when we're fulfilling the purposes God has designed us for, guess what? It gets really fun. Because now you're in, you're in your lane. Now you're in your sweet spot. Now you're doing what only you can do. We're not trying to be anybody else. We're being the person God has designed us to be. And we're right in the center of his plans, his purposes. We know we're loved. We know we're affirmed by him. We're getting our marching orders from him. We've been given this free will choice. And guess what? We are, we are now, we're, we're living the dream. And guys, there's men in this room. There's people I'm connected to that are doing that exact thing right now. That exact thing right now. Uh, I, 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 let me see. I have, I have some examples here. I think about, I think about Dan Mears. Casey Wolf, you know Dan. He is he is taking mascotting to a brand new level. He is in his sweet spot. Uh, Bob McGann, I think Bob is is Bob here. Is, yeah, right here. Bob's here. Bob, uh, Bob and I had this conversation two weeks ago. There's some experiences, and there's there's some expertise that he's been getting getting for years and years and years and years. Some of that, and I'll just give a, a shout out to Bobby Bell. 2010, Bobby Bell drugged Bob here. He, he, he knew he was in a bad spot. And 12 years later, all these things that he's been going through has allowed him to have a very sweet ministry and purpose at Regen with guys that enter. They have to come through the doors and meet him. And he, and he connects them from that point. And Bob told me on the phone, he says, Rod, it's, it's almost like an out-of-body experience. I'm seeing all the stuff that God's been doing. And now I'm right in the spot. He's perfectly designed. It's a beautiful story, Bob. A beautiful story. I mean, that 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 that's what happens, guys, when we're in the center, in the center of rising up and being counted. You're not outsourcing your self worth to somebody else. You're saying, God, I'm going to look to you. You know me best. You know my skills, ability. You know my DNA. You know what I'm designed for. And now, Lord, help me to be the man you want me to be. Make me a king. Not for my glory, but for your glory. I've already mentioned this, but our current manhood identity culture faces unprecedented challenges. And the answer is for kingdom men to rise up, to make a difference, to be leaders, not followers. And guys, there's a great biblical example of this I wrote this, throughout history, God has called men to intervene on behalf of a dying land. Ezekiel 22.30 records it this way. I searched for a man among them who would build up a wall, stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. The problem wasn't there wasn't a lot of males around. There were males around. But God was not looking for a male. He was looking for a man. And there was a big difference. I wrote this, you are a man, not just a male, when you take responsibility under God's authority. So while many of us are waiting on God to fix what is wrong, God is waiting on us to step up and do what is right. He's waiting on men who don't just talk about faith, but who walk in it. These are the men whose actions demonstrate that they believe God is the one they claim to worship. So men, it's time to step up. It's time to rise up. It's time to wake up. Three verses you see here I wrote in your notes. Micah 6, 8 says, He has told you, old man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Pretty simple, pretty profound. And then it says this, Psalm 112, 1 to 3, Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Guys, a lot of men have not strategically and specifically stepped up to their manhood, and we're causing division, we're causing destruction because we've abdicated those responsibilities. 
We've not taken this call responsibly. And here's what happens, guys. When we take it responsibly, guess what? There's a calm and a peace that begins to take place in everything we do. In fact, that's what Leviticus 26.6 says. It says, I will grant peace in the land so that you may be lied down with, with, with no one making you tremble. I will also eliminate harmful beasts from the land and no sword will pass through your land. So guys, here's what, here's where we've been created. We've got a spot. We've got a post. God wants to fulfill a, a purpose and a plan for your life. He scouted you out. He's pursued you. He's even drafted you for his kingdom team. And he's counting on you to do something great. Something you've been drafted for, for the purposes of God. You know, it kills me to give this illustration, but it doesn't matter where you've been drafted, a high draft pick or a low draft pick. And remember, Tom Brady was a low draft pick. 33rd pick of the sixth round of the 2000 draft. A lot of people way before him. And guess what? He's the last man standing at his draft class. He's got seven Super Bowl rings on his finger. Uh, that, that irks me. <laughs> he was a low draft pick, but guess what? He has fulfilled a purpose. You got to give him credit. You got to give him credit. Uh, the hard work, the effort, the passion of the game has made him one of the greatest of all time. So I'll end by saying this. This principle ought to ring true for kingdom men. It's your willingness to show up in the day, in life day, in and out, to be present in relationships, put forth the effort on the job, commit, give, apply diligence, study the word, invest in others, and the like will shape your own legacy of distinction. And so here's the three things that you can do. I'm going to make this super simple. Here's, if you want to be this kind of a kingdom man, here's three things you can do. And you can do these literally all the time. First one is this. I, and I, I actually say this a lot to you guys. So you're going to feel like I'm a broken record here. But I say this a lot. The first is you need to show up. Just show up. Be present. Stay consistent. I get really concerned with men when men go AWOL, when all of a sudden they disappear. You don't see them anymore. They're not at TGIW. They're not at church. They're not with their family. They're, they're, they're out. Where are they at? Where are they at? Get visible. Showing up, guys, is half the battle. Just showing up. Here's the second thing. Look up. Once you show up, look up. Get your marching orders from God. The only one who can tell you who you are and whose you are. So you do those three things that Craig White talked about. You ask and you seek and you knock. You've got this running conversation going on with God and you're getting your marching orders or your assignment and your duties from him and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're plugged into to what the word of God is saying. And you're not, you're not uh, looking for other sources for your guidance and wisdom and knowledge. So you're looking up to the heavens. And again, God is not trying to confuse you. He's not playing hide and seek. He wants to let you know what to do. The question is, are you going to listen to him? And then here's the third thing we do. Once we, once we show up and once we look up, then we, then we hook up. We hook up. We don't isolate ourselves. We don't go solo. We put ourselves in places, a position where we're with, we're with iron sharpeners. We're holding, we're holding others accountable. We're holding ourselves accountable. We understand that two is better than one, that, that we're better when we're together. And gentlemen, if you do those three simple things, show up, look up, and hook up, guess what? You will build a legacy, a legacy of distinction, a legacy of excellence. So let me say this in closing. God has given every one of us a responsibility to maximize the gifts he's given us, to use them for his glory. Men, this means that you need to lead your family. You need to lead your family well. You need to stand up as a leader in your church, provide direction that your community needs. We're facing troubled times, but when godly men stay involved, stay engaged, stay alert, stay awake, guess what? We can make a difference. For his glory and not our good. So Lord, that's my prayer for these men. That's our prayer for all of us, Lord, that we would not miss the assignment, the purpose, the calling, the high calling that you have for every one of us. We have value. We are not an accident. We're not a mistake. You've got a plan for our life, and it's a really good plan. We know that you love us that you want to give us way more than we could dream or imagine. So, Lord, we invite you to reign and rule in our life. We invite you 
to, to uh, provide the Holy Spirit every step of the way to lead and direct us as you see fit. We do this again, not for our glory, but praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week, okay?